Jared, there are people in the waiting room. Allow them. Yes. The meeting is now live also on Facebook. Over to you, Ocheng. We can start now. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening from whatever time zone you're at. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today for today's masterclass. Yeah, just uh, before we start, I'd like to give it to our Commissioner Mwanza to make the introductory remarks to us through so that I'll go back, uh, I'll come back with the introductions formally. Thank you. Back to you, Commissioner. Th thank you. Thank you, uh, Arnold. Uh, today we are privileged to have a Supreme Court judge who's going to take us through the masterclass in practicing before the Supreme Court. Uh, and this idea was conceived uh, maybe in the past, during the past campaigns, whereby I was running uh, webinars and members gave me a challenge that whether I win or not, I should continue with this. So I took up the challenge and Justice Lenaula has gladly accepted to be one of our distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, Justice Lenaula is uh, known to all of us for many years and is known also to me, I must confess. And I remember once I practiced before him and uh, I was not very funny. And he told me, Mwanza, <laughs> when you submit before the court, please stop the jokes. Go direct to the point. And I will invite all of you for an afternoon of learning and uh, have an open mind. Arnold, you can do now the formal introductions for the rest uh, so that we start. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, uh, by way of introduction, uh, permit me to introduce myself. My name is Arnold Chengo Ginga. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, practicing under Uchengo Ginga and Company Advocates. And uh, for today's session, I'll be a co-host. I'm joined by my colleague, Crispin Bosire. He's also an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Again, I'm also joined by Jared Gekombe, a PhD candidate at the University of uh, Pretoria, South Africa. Uh, I also need to mention Chris is also an alumni of the University of Pretoria, South Africa, the Center for Human Rights. Uh, uh, the course. Now, uh, for all of you, I'm sure you know Justice Lenola. Uh, permit me to read uh, his bios. It's quite detailed. It's such a privilege introducing the judge to you guys today. Now, uh, as an alumni of the University of Nairobi, he joined the Chill Service in 2003 and worked as resident judge in Embu, Meru, Machakos, and Kakamega High Courts. And as a High Court judge, he has also served as a commissioner at the Judicial Service Commission. Uh, he was previously a member of the board, Judicial Training Institute, JTI, and chairman of the Kenya Magistrates and Judges Association, and treasurer of the East African Magistrates and Judges Association. And now, until his appointment as the judge of the Supreme Court, Justice Isaac Lenola was the presiding judge of the Constitutional and Human Rights Division at the High Court in Milimani, Nairobi, and previously served a resident judge in Embu, Meru, Machakos, and Kakamega, where, uh, as we are all aware, he rendered uh, illuminating and groundbreaking decisions in civil and criminal law, human rights, devolution, separation of powers, among other areas of jurisprudence. Now, uh, other than being a, a judge in Kenya, judge has also served as a judge and deputy principal judge at the Court of First Instance at the East African Court of Justice. That was from the year 2011 and 2018. And as a judge at the Residual Special Court for Sierra Leone, uh, from the year 2013 to date, and currently as a role aware, uh, is now the vice chair of this particular court in Sierra Leone. 
Now, uh, currently also, Judge is the president of the Advisory Council of Strathmore Institute for Advanced Studies in International Criminal Justice and president of the International Association of Refugee and Migration Judges, IARMJ. He's also a fellow at McLuhan College, York University in Toronto, Canada, and a fellow at Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. He is also president of the Judicial Action Group and a member of the Commonwealth Magistrates uh, and Judges Association, the Accountability Panel of the Wildlife Justice Commission, Advisory Board of Trustees, Laws, Africa, and the African Judges and Juries Forum. Again, uh, as I conclude on that lengthy bio, he was awarded the Law Society of Kenya Award for Distinguished Service in the Administration of Justice in 2008, the East African Law Society Honorary Membership Award for Exemplary Services and the Development of Jurisprudence in Kenya and the East African region that was in the year 2015, as well as the Distinguished Service Awards in the Service of the International Association of Refugee and Migration Judges that was in the year 2014 and 2018. He is also a recipient of the Moran of the Order of the Burning Spear and Chief of the Order of the Burning Spear, uh, CBS, from the President of the Republic of Kenya for Distinguished Service in the Administration of Justice in Kenya and East African region. He has also been named Juris, Jurist of the Year by the International Commission of Juries Kenya. That was in the year 2019. Now, other than the beautiful CV by the judge, now, as we, all, we are all aware, the judge is also an author of various books. Uh, and the, the first publication I remember, that was the Bioethics of Medical Advances of Genetic Manipulation. That was a 2018 publication by Longon, uh, which simply looks at the nexus between the law and medicine. Now, secondly, uh, you're also uh, aware, most of you are aware of judge's recent publication, that is the Constitutional Law Doctrines and the Litigation of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, which uh, basically, uh, discusses a lot about the Constitution of Kenya 2010 and the comparative aspects on jurisprudence emanating therefrom, and just the comparative analysis looking at uh, what African courts have said on similar issues on uh, fundamental rights and freedoms. Now, uh, also uh, currently, and as a build up to this webinar again, uh, Judge is currently also working on another uh, forthcoming publication, which is the Compendium on appellate advocacy and jurisprudence in Kenya, because, uh, and as a build to this uh, actually webinar is that we need to actually learn a, a thing or two about appellate advocacy, especially at the Supreme Court of Kenya. Now, uh, because of the webinar, again, uh, the we webinar uh, comes at a very opportune moment because uh, the nature of appellate advocacy, somehow complex and not as straightforward as the normal uh, litigation route. Yeah? And for instance, even the court, uh, court of Appeal judges and the Supreme Court judges uh, on one or two occasions lamented over the nature of practice at the appellate level. And uh, permit me to quote uh, this excerpt. This was a decision by the Court of Appeal. And uh, this is what uh, Justice Kiage, for example, said. The application before me dated 16th September 2020 is yet another poignant and disturbing reminder that the craft of litigation in this country, and specifically appellate litigation, is fast sinking towards the nadir and calls for urgent and concerted efforts to arrest the slides toward, towards a point of no return beyond retrieval. I can only hope that judges, law schools, and senior practitioners see the lapses, such as revealed in the motion before me, as symptomatic of the broken window that unchecked can only have a binger of who has to come. Again, uh, permit me to skip that part. Again, go back to the Supreme Court again, where in, in this case, uh, the popular Nick, uh, Nicholas Kipto uh, Salat case, where even the Supreme Court itself uh, lamented over the nature of practice by advocate. Permit me to read this as a way of uh, just a brief background to, uh, to us today's webinar, so that uh, the Supreme Court find as follows. In developing this jurisprudence, the court will not shun from correcting glaring errors of law when presented by litigants and or counsel. It is unfortunate that the learned counsel for the second respondent has sought to strike out the draft petition on the basis that the notice of appeal was filed before grant of leave and cited 32 of the Supreme Court rules 2011 in support of this claim. This error is puzzling, that is the Supreme Court saying, an advocate is an officer of the court 
and has the duty to aid the court to reach a legitimate determination founded on sound law. Hence, an advocate has to be abreast with the law and keep pace with the various developments. It is surprising that the Learned Council referred to the Supreme Court rules 2011, which were repealed on 26 October 2012 by legal notice number 123 by the enactment of the Supreme Court Act, uh, uh, Supreme Court rules 2012. Now, uh, these two examples uh, uh, actually highlight on the some of the uh, complexities of appellate advocacy in Kenya. So that again, uh, the unfortunate bit is that not most matters get it, get to reach uh, at the appellate level. So that not so many advocates are familiar with appellate uh, litigation or even practicing at the Supreme Court because the matters are always uh, very few. So that for the purpose of this webinar, a lot of time will be spent on the Q&A because that is where like uh, most of you have raised a lot of questions and it will be easier to pinpoint uh, a judge on what to address and all that. But the judge will uh, begin with a general presentation on the overall uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, advocacy in general. And uh, just to point uh, just on a few issues, for example, uh, although we are focusing a lot on the uh, Supreme Court practice, there is a lot yet to be learned in terms of appellate advocacy. For example, even beginning with the whole aspect in terms of uh, the nature of appeals itself, the nature of appellate advocacy itself. And then you look at issues such as, for example, the right to appeal in itself, then limitations on the right to appeal. For example, we have time-bound limitations, then limitation by scope and substance, where we have laws that say you can only appeal on questions of laws, or you can appeal both on questions of law and fact. Then you also have uh, the, the doctrine of limitation by silence, so that when a statute uh, does not address the question whether a party has a right of appeal or not, what happens? Is it limitation by silence? Yeah. Then again, we have express limitations, so that, uh, for example, we have certain statutes uh, completely put a bar on the right to appeal, so that, for example, even if you look at election statutes, for instance, yeah, you cannot appeal issues of uh, NCA elections beyond the high court, the high court is the final stop. Then you have limitation by default or acquiescence, whereby a party uh, may waive that right by either choosing to go for review. You cannot review, go for review, and appeal at the same time. If you go for review, it is deemed you, uh, you uh, 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 acquire, acquiesced on your right to appeal. Again, one cannot again appeal the decision of a superior court uh, to a lower court. That we've seen in the recent past uh, attempts for example, to challenge a decision of a superior court before a lower court. And finally, we also have the, uh, the unknown concept of the leapfrog appeals, which was expressly provided for under the 2011 rules of the Supreme Court, uh, but it has since been repealed. So for the effect of this leapfrog appeals is that you can appeal directly. You don't need to go through the Court of Appeal. If a matter is so extremely urgent, you can leapfrog and go directly to the Supreme Court. This is common in other jurisdictions like uh, uh, South Africa. Yeah, with those few opening remarks, I take this opportunity to once again thank all of you for joining us today, and I invite Judge uh, to take over. Thank you, all of you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you very much, uh, Arnold, for that uh, beautiful introduction. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Mwanza. Congratulations on your election. And uh, uh, thank you for this invitation. It, it's a joy uh, to speak to young council, but from what I gather, uh, this uh, the attendance is just way beyond the expectation of the organizers. And that is useful because this kind of conversation um, is important, even as we uh, journey uh, into a, a better world for us, both uh, on the bar and, and on the bench. Two disclaimers. Uh, number one, whatever I shall say here will not represent the views of the Supreme Court as a collective body, nor, nor of any other judge except myself. So do not, uh, after this presentation, file an application for review or for setting aside and say, uh, in this case, the Supreme Court said as follows, but in the webinar, Judge Denaola said as follows, therefore we need to review that decision. You will still get dismissed. Uh, because my, my views here are limited to myself. The second issue is that um, I wish I had more time because the, the way um, Omwanza crafted the presentation 
um, I would need more than just a one hour masterclass. I'll probably need a whole week uh, to give an exposition of all the wonderful issues that were raised um, uh, and asked for me to speak about. So let me see what I can do in the 45 minutes I have. And, and in the Q&A, I will answer as many as I can, but because I received some questions in advance, I can also attempt to answer them through my presentation. So here we go. Um, the first issue for me to say by introduction is this. In my time as an advocate, and by the way, I have practiced law from the afternoon of my division, my admission as an advocate on the 19th of September, 1991, to date, because I have never been outside the courtroom uh, for any more period than probably three, four days. So I have learned a lot at a practical level, and a lot of what I'm going to say will be practical as opposed to the theories uh, which we have been taught at School of Law in the trial advocacy classes. Number two, my own experience as a judge has taught me that um, appearances before the lower court, the high court, the court of appeal, and the Supreme Court are different experiences. And so even for me as a judge, practicing before the Supreme Court uh, 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 for you advocates and for me sitting as a judge will not will be quite different um, from appearing in other courts or sitting in other courts as I did. And so whatever I'm going to say will be focused more on the Supreme Court and to guide you uh, 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 in your next appearances. I assume that, that the senior advocates who are here will probably hear things that they've seen or heard or know but this presentation was crafted specifically for younger advocates who are aspiring to be regulars at the Supreme Court. Uh, and so the first thing I should say is this, it is not just enough that you appear before the Supreme Court, particularly as the Apex Court, the expectation of the law and as a final court and by judges and by the constitution is that you as an advocate is required to bear great responsibility because that is the last court of resort for any litigant. And so if you can play around at the magistrate's court, if you can play around at the high court and assume that even if I lose, I can appeal and win, there is no such opportunity for you at the Supreme Court. And therefore, it's required of you that you are dedicated, your presentation should be more than meticulous, and your advocacy must be more than compelling. I have seen advocates appearing before us at the Supreme Court, and I wonder whether they think they are before RM Maradal, where I come from. Because the preparation is pedestrian, the arguments are flippant, and you wonder whether they know where they are and the implication of them losing a case at the Supreme Court. And therefore, it is important that you must understand the unique role and importance of the Supreme Court, both as the Apex Court and the court charged with the final authority in upholding the rule of law, protecting the constitution and ensuring justice for all. And so when you come to the Supreme Court, there is an expectation that your preparation would be top notch and your research are not of the usual kind. Like Arnold said, and I think, thank you Arnold for for letting the cat out of the bag. In that book, which will come out later in the year, we are saying that you must, as advocates, understand legal issues, review relevant case law and statutes, and craft persuasive legal arguments that are grounded in sound legal reason. It can never be more serious than appearing at the Supreme Court. The other issue which I will come back to at the end of my presentation is Remember the Supreme Court, you don't have the benefit of your witness helping you if you're not able to bring your case out. Some witnesses are actually sharper than some lawyers. And so when, in, when, when examining a witness, your witness can bring out matters that you could not bring out as an advocate. At the Supreme Court, it is you, the advocate. There is no witness. It is you who must therefore bring out clear and concise submissions. And your communication must be absolutely unimpeachable. If you cannot communicate to the court, go and herd cows, go and dig domas, or go and fish in Lake Victoria. You have no business being in the Supreme Court. 
Your arguments must be logical and organized. You must respond to questions from the bench effectively. And I should say this, both the Supreme Court of Kenya, the Supreme Court of the UK, Supreme Court of India, the Supreme Court of the US, and I've visited all, you must learn that the questions by the judges are directed at you, to, not just to clarify their minds as individual judges, but to clarify the minds of the other judges. Judges sit before a hearing and they conference at length. There's a conference before the hearing, there's a conference after the hearing. At before the hearing, judges do argue with each other. The questions you are asked as an advocate sometimes are not meant for you. They are meant for the neighbor. So the answer you give can justify a position the judge may have temporarily taken before the hearing. So don't assume the questions are a waste of time or the judges are idle. It is as important as the judgment that they're going to write. And before then I go to the substance of my presentation, I must say this, there is this wrong assumption by advocates that I am here to argue my client's case, nothing else matters. And my instructions are as follows, and therefore, whatever I say, take it to be what my client has told me. That is the wrong approach, I've been issued. You must remember that you are also appearing before a court of law where certain rules apply, and where respect for the court and legal processes are as important as a duty to represent your client. And therefore, when you appear before the Supreme Court, take it as a privilege and a solemn responsibility. Approach each case with diligence, professionalism, and dedication to justice, and you must at all times uphold the values of our profession and contribute to the administration of justice in our republic. If you carry nothing else from this presentation, carry those words. You must uphold the values of our profession and contribute to the administration of justice in Kenya. To the main presentation, I was asked to speak about inside the Supreme Court, a judge's perspective. I've been a judge now of the Supreme Court since 2016. So I'm heading to my eighth year later this year. I served at the High Court for 13 years and I practiced law for 13 years. So cumulatively, what I'm going to speak to you about are born of my experiences, both as a judge and as a practitioner, but more fundamentally now as a judge in your apex court. The first issue that we must always remember, both as judges and advocates, is a question of jurisdiction. And the Supreme Court has got very constrained jurisdiction. And therefore, when you come to the Supreme Court, please appreciate Article 163. If you don't appreciate 163, you have no business coming there. You must appreciate 3A and 3B. Because the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is such that if you don't fit your case within it, then a lot of the judgments of the Supreme Court, by the way, a lot of rulings, initially, were based on dismissals on account of jurisdiction. I won't speak about presidential election petitions. You know about them. When I was interviewing some magistrates, uh, some candidates for the magistracy, and even for law clerks, a lot of them knew no decision of the Supreme Court, but they knew and had read about Raila Odinga 2013, Raila Odinga 2017, Raila Odinga 2022, but they didn't know what the Supreme Court said except it overturned one election, upheld the others. Please read those decisions uh, for 2013, 2017, and 2022. The second issue is, of course, the question of uh, um, the appeals that come to the Supreme Court. And, and, and I must say this at this point. One of the disappointing uh, things I've seen in the Supreme Court is where advocates have not read past decisions of the court they file appeals under 163 uh, 4A as a matter of right, and they say there are constitutional questions that arise from this appeal. 
Where are those constitutional questions? They were crafted when filing the appeal, which means they don't know the basic rule that for you to approach the Supreme Court as a matter of right, the matter must have involved the interpretation and application of the constitution from the trial court. So that if you are introducing constitutional questions at the Supreme Court, you're wasting your time. Unless the Court of Appeal has addressed a constitutional question, the Supreme Court will not open its doors for you. And that is why. Please read the case of Lawrence Ndutu and 6,000 others versus Kenya Brewers Limited. If you don't read that case, don't come to this court. What did the court say in that case? It said, Article 163.4a must be seen to be laying down the principle that not all intended appeals lie from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court. Only those appeals arising from cases involving the interpretation or application of the Constitution can be entertained by the Supreme Court. The only other instance where an appeal may lie to the Supreme Court under 163.4b is where the matter is a matter that raises issues of great public importance. And therefore, towards this end, it is not the mere allegation in pleadings by a party that clothes an appeal with the attributes of constitutional interpretation or application. The appeal must originate from the Court of Appeal case where issues of contestation revolved around the interpretation or application of the Constitution. So that it is not enough for you to come and say, my Lord, look at uh, the heading of my petition of appeal. Or my Lord, look at my reasoning and the grounds for the appeal. It is a matter for constitutional interpretation. No, it is not. You must apply the principles set out in uh, Lawrence Ndutu. A lot of you have heard of Ali, Ali Hassan Joho, but more fundamentally, please read all the decisions by the Court of Appeal in Gatirao Peter Munya versus Dixon Mwenda Kidinji. The court said this. Following the Ngoge case, a lot of you know Peter Oduor Ngoge. Following the Ngoge decision, the court said in, uh, in Munya, the import of the court statement in the Ngoge case is, where, is that where specific provisions of the Constitution cannot be identified as having formed the gist of the course at the Court of Appeal, the very least an appellant should demonstrate is that the court reasoning and the conclusions put in context can properly be said to have taken a trajectory of constitutional interpretation or application. So that in the two cases, you notice how many times the court says constitutional interpretation, constitutional application. So if you come to the Supreme Court and you have not read these two cases and brought your case within its, the purview, you are standing on stilts. The second question of normal appeals is a question of general public importance. And my friends, again, I have noticed a very ridiculous and sometimes amusing approach by advocates. Initially, people didn't know that for a matter to be one of GPI, you must begin by the Court of Appeals certifying the matter as raising matter of general public importance. But if the Court of Appeal does not grant you certification, you are entitled to seek a review at the Supreme Court. And we have done reviews where we have said the Court of Appeal, no, no, this matter raises matters of great public importance, general public importance. We need to have a chance at it. In that part of jurisdiction, please look at the case of Hermanas Philippa Stein versus Giovanni Ginecci Rusconi. Just call it the Hermanas Philippa Stein case. And the court said, as far as matters of public importance are involved, the issue must transcend the specific circumstances of a particular case. Where it's one of law, it must be a matter of law that has a huge public interest. And the mere apprehension that the lower courts have done injustice to you is not sufficient to bring this such a matter to the level of general public importance. And you must, by the way, another error that I see, parties never identify what matters they think are elements of general public importance. Please identify them succinctly, shortly, precisely, to the point, and clearly. 
don't, don't say, my Lord, uh, um, I live in Rongai, and the influence from the Rongai, Rongai town is a matter of general public importance. What is that? What have you just told us? Clarity is lacking. The issue, of course, of jurisdiction is regarding uh, appeals from tribunals formed to consider a judge's removal. A very unique jurisdiction. And you know very well that in the case of uh, Justice Mutava, Justice Muya, and Justice Chitembwe, the Supreme Court upheld decisions of the tribunal and said the judges ought to go home. But a unique case, which again, I encourage you to read, is a case of Lady Justice Mary Gitumbi, who was removed under Article 168 of the Constitution because of mental illness. That case, that judgment, I encourage you to read it because it speaks to something very, very unique and something we never ever have handled in this country. It is the first case of its kind. Many more will come because as you know, mental health uh, is a big issue in this country and mental illness is a big issue. It affects you, counsel. It also affects us, ad ad judges. In fact, I'm starting sometimes to think we as judges uh, may require more help uh, because of the issues we go through. The new advocates who can walk into a restaurant, a bar, have a drink and drown their sorrows, most judges cannot do that. The other jurisdiction which I think is important and again misunderstood is the adversary opinion jurisdiction. And please read the Regender Commission case, read the IBC uh, uh, adversary opinion. Again, the court here said two important things that I've seen advocates making mistakes about as late as this year. You must always come to the Supreme Court having first gone to the Attorney General to seek an opinion. If you are dissatisfied with the Attorney General, then come to us. We are not like the Attorney General, the Chief Advisor to National Government and devolved units. It is the Attorney General who, under the Constitution, is called the Chief Advisor to Government. We are not. So we have said, first go to the Attorney General, and we have started petitions out, advisory opinions out, and references because parties have come directly to us. They have not gone to the Attorney General first. Please go to the Attorney General. If you are satisfied, don't come to us. If you are dissatisfied, come to us and bring that opinion to us and say, I have gone to the AG. He has given me a matope opinion. Now, please give me a properly uh, thought out uh, opinion. You, of course, know that we are also entitled to hear matters involving the validity of a declaration of a state of emergency. And a lot of you remember the, the back and forth during the COVID pandemic about the role of the courts in a state of emergency, in a pandemic like COVID, uh, there is something at night where there's that thing, curfew. And I think the High Court settled that. We have not handled any matter regarding a state of emergency because, thank God, Kenya, in our time, has not had to do that. Those who were born before the 60s, they know of the shifter war. There was a state of emergency in those days. The other aspect of practice before the Supreme Court, which I think is important to bring to your attention, is the fact that the Supreme Court is the only court which under the Constitution is entitled to create its own rules of procedure so that we don't apply. And again, I've seen advocates coming to us and actually invoke, invoke, invoking the Civil Procedure Act and the rules as late as this year. And I'm asking myself, the Supreme Court is going to be 12 years later this year. Which advocate in this country, unless they come from us, does not know that the CPA does not apply to proceedings before the Court of Appeal. Neither do the appellate court rules. But as late as this year, I saw an advocate, not one, not two, filing matters and they were quoting night, nicely, typed out. Civil Procedure Act. It does not apply because the Supreme Court is uniquely allowed by Article 163A to create its own rules of procedure. So look at the rules of the court for 2012, 2016, and 2020. 20. is here, and the limitation to how far the court can go in making these rules was determined in the Umbati Umanza case, 
which was, uh, which was uh, I think, issued in 2021 or 22. Please look at it. So when you come to the Supreme Court, you also know how far the Supreme Court itself can go in keeping within uh, uh, the strictures of the Constitution. The third issue, which I think is important for you to understand, is that the Supreme Court is not bound by its decisions. So one of you wrote a very interesting message this morning, a question, it was a statement, but let me call it a question, saying the Supreme Court uh, uh, is giving conflicting decisions. First of all, I don't know what decisions those are because I'm in charge of keeping the court uh, uh, knowledgeable as to the consistency of decisions. I know none. But the council then asked me, what should the Supreme Court do if its decisions are inconsistent? First of all, let us discuss stare decisis for a minute. Those who went to Latin school would know that stare decisis et non quieta movere means to abide by the precedents and not to disturb settled points of law. And therefore, once the Supreme Court has settled the law, then it's settled. But again, the question says, the Supreme Court in Article 163 7 says, all courts other than the Supreme Court are bound by the decisions of the Supreme Court. So that at the purely logical level, if we were to read 163 7 without any tangential thinking, the Supreme Court can decide to overturn itself. I know no case where the Supreme Court has said you are wrong. I know one ruling where the Supreme Court said we can review and order on costs. We have not had the opportunity, I'm looking forward to it, where we can actually say Kibos Distillers was wrong or Carissa Chengo was wrong. And then we give a different interpretation. So those who have come with this, and by the way, there's an advocate who wrote a, a, a statement, a question today and says the Supreme Court is behaving. Uh, uh, oh, there's this heretic decision of the Supreme Court. First language, gentlemen and ladies. Heretic, heresy. The Supreme Court must have an opportunity someday to look back at its decisions. We don't have to go very... The Supreme Court of the U.S., which has much the same jurisdiction, has overturned Roe versus Wade. A day will come when the Supreme Court of Kenya will overturn one of its decisions. But it must be done in a manner that parties have the opportunity to argue on both sides why a decision should be overturned, not by Facebook posts and not by social media posts on, on Twitter, but by a proper known logical reasoning of the Supreme Court through submissions made by counsel. Please read Rai versus Rai on how to distinguish decisions of the Supreme Court from each other and how the Supreme Court must maintain consistency and precedent because settling the law means that today we can't say one thing and tomorrow we say another on the same question. The other issue, which I think is important for you to understand as practitioners is a question of case management. I have sat as a judge of the High Court. Uh, I wasn't lucky to go through the Court of Appeal in a sense. Case management is quite different from court management. Court management is, Omaza, you know this because you suffered a few times, how you run your court. Those of you who have appeared before me would know by 10, I was done with mentions and I was starting to hear my matters. So that it's important for you to appreciate, to know. I know judges are different and we are working very hard to ensure their consistency of court management and and case management. So we don't have one judge in Machakos working differently from a judge in Nairobi. But the more important point about the Supreme Court is that the Supreme Court says, we do not allow delays in our matters. We say we don't allow unnecessary application. We say we don't allow adjournments. And I'll come to that no adjournment policy in a minute. Last year, uh, 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 last month, when we had the last matters uh, for, for last term, we realized that apart from two matters, which are 2021, 2022, we are now hearing matters filed in 2023. 
And our intention is that by the end of the year, latest next year, at the Supreme Court, you file your petition, it's hard and determined the same year you file it. So don't assume those of you who are used to the tactics of practice, where you know you have a bad case, so you now deploy and employ delaying tactics. You'll suffer gravely if you attempt those at the Supreme Court. At the registry of the Supreme Court, probably the best that we have in this country because of, again, the workload, I'm sure, please look at the Supreme Court practice directions. They guide you in how you file documents. I've seen some documents that shock me, they have come to the Supreme Court because advocates don't take, they look at the practice direction and look at the rules. For example, the size of the paper, the print, I've seen some of you who, who think they're ingenious. When we tell you file only 15 pages of submissions, you squeeze them until even my, my, my bifocus, I can't see. They are like little ants on the paper and you're trying to save space. But if I can't read your submissions, why are they presented? It's better to have the 15 pages you're asking for than to bring the smallest font, I don't know what they're called, and expect the judge to read and give you a good ruling. In fact, it is your loss. So please look at the quality of the paper, the numbering, and so on, because those are in those uh, proceedings. A unique aspect of the Supreme Court now picked by the Court of Appeal is with regard to determination of interlocutory applications. The Supreme Court does not hear interlocutory applications as a matter of uh, thumb, as a rule of thumb, orally. You file your submissions, we conference, we draft, we send you the ruling. But of course, it is not cast in stone. There are instances where you can apply, I've seen none so far, where you say there is a reason why I must have this application hard orally. If you do so and the court considers this fit, it will be hard orally. But so far, no advocate has written to us to give us reason why we should hear an appeal, an application orally. To gown or not to gown. We punished an advocate two years ago because it was soon after COVID. And we had said as a matter of practice that you must have your, your robes on, even as we have ours, even if our hearings are conducted virtually. The advocate was in his chambers. He was just insolent. He refused to robe. He remained in a tie like myself. We banged him with a, with a very heavy uh, 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 um, bill for the adjournment of the day. Please robe when you appear for the Supreme Court because it is a rule that is existing. And until we remove it, sorry, we must continue doing so. Now, let me then move very quickly to an important aspect which is what I guess a lot of you wanted to hear. The duty of the judge to defend the constitution. The duty of a judge to uphold the rule of law and enforce the Bill of Rights. Aaron Barak, former president of the Supreme Court, wrote a very interesting book called A Judge on Judging, the role of a Supreme Court in a democracy. And in that book, he said, it is a priority for judges in all modern democracies to ensure that they protect the constitution, the rule of law, and democracy itself. The jury is out there whether in fact the Supreme Court of Kenya has protected the constitution or has upheld the constitution. Opinions are as divided as Kenya is, particularly because the Supreme Court of Kenya has not been looked at in the last 12 years from the prism and from the lens of its day-to-day -day work as a court, but only from the lens of the presidential election petition, which comes every five years. I've received a lot of messages from people telling me, what do you do between one petition and the other? See, you're very idle. You should just go back to the high court where you are busy. Truth be said, the Supreme Court is challenging out decisions of grave importance to this country outside that one or two weeks 
when we are in the eye of the storm. So we are bound by Article 31 to respect and uphold the Constitution. The Supreme Court Act, in fact, Section 3, speaks loudly about our duty as a final judicial authority. And, and I can speak to this and say, a lot of you don't know the pain of a judge who is the final judge. It is not as easy as you think that we sit and flippantly, pedestrianly determine that A should win, B should lose. Sometimes we take time. We delay because we are going back and forth in arguments. I know a case where we argued consecutively for a week and we couldn't agree. And finally, we took a break, came back, argued, and we had a majority and, and, and dissenters. It is not as easy. So therefore, Section 3 tells us we must assert the supremacy of the Constitution. We must provide authoritative impartial interpretation of the Constitution. We must develop rich jurisprudence that respects Kenya's history and tradition. Some of you, Arnold, Dombati, and others know I am I'm called every other month to speak somewhere in the world on some subject. Contrary to what some of you may think, the Supreme Court Kenya is hugely respected and our judgments are hugely respected. One judge in Zambia told me he sits on the Supreme Court and they have a constitutional court below the Supreme Court. And he said it actually annoys them that the constitutional court of Zambia borrows jurisprudence from the Kenyan Supreme Court and not from the Zambian Supreme Court. So when you say we develop rich jurisprudence, I can speak with authority and say, yes, we are. We went to India and our judgment in Muruatetu was being used by the Indian Supreme Court in a hearing where I sat through. So there is a lot that we can borrow uh, uh, from the Bible about a prophet being recognized in the village. Uh, elsewhere, but not in their own village. The question of the Bill of Rights. It is true, uh, what I've heard before, that in fact the High Court is the mother court in terms of interpretation of the Constitution, because that's what I call Article 23, Article 165, 3D say. But who settles matters of constitutional interpretation. It is the Supreme Court. I know this because I sat at the High Court for six years, heading that division. So the duty to uphold the rule of law and enforce the Bill of Rights is a duty to all courts, mostly to the High Court and to courts of equal status. But the settlement of questions on this issue is done by the Supreme Court. And therefore, when you come to the Supreme Court, please look at Article 259. Look at Article, sorry, sorry. Look at Article 165, 3D, Article 23, and always craft 24 and 25, and always craft your constitutional questions around those issues because only then can they properly rise to be determined finally by the Supreme Court. If you don't craft your pleadings at the High Court in a manner that can attract the attention of the Supreme Court, the matter will die at the Court of Appeal. It's called ingenuity from the bar, innovation from the bar, innovation in pleadings, innovation in drafting. The Supreme Court also is, entitled, is obligated to progressively and holistically interpret the law. And that is the meaning of Article 259. And please, whatever you do as an advocate, and whoever you are, if you are a mad person who believes in the Bill of Rights, please read article two, the articles I said, but add Article 259. And please buy the book we just released with Arnold. It will guide you. Some of the people who are doing interviews for uh, High Court Judgeship are telling me that that book is becoming helpful because it is written in a simple language and gives a fundamentally sound exposition of matters under the Bill of Rights. Buy it for your own sake if you want to become a judge. I'm now becoming a salesman. But in terms of holistic interpretation of the Constitution, please look at our decision in the matter of the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. 
the court said, what is meant by holistic interpretation of the constitution? It must mean interpreting the constitution in context. It is a contextual analysis of a provision reading it alongside and against other provisions so as to maintain a rationale of what the constitution must be taken to mean in the light of its history of the issues in dispute and of the prevailing circumstances. If you go to any court and you speak about interpretation of the constitution of this case, I don't quote this case, you're starting on a very wrong footing. Some of the questions that I got from you speak to judicial independence and impartiality. One of you asked me, uh, does the Supreme Court have objectivity? And what happens if a judge of the court or judges of the court are subject? First of all, there is this misunderstanding that judges, both of the lower courts and the Supreme Court, are superhuman, they have no feelings, they have no emotions. You don't need to go far. Again, go to the US. In the US, unlike here, judges openly disclose their party affiliation. And the court makes decisions depending on the majority, Republicans versus Democrats. I can tell you this now because I was in JC at the time. When we're interviewing the initial judges for the Supreme Court, we thought in our wisdom, let us bring judges who a lot that we're calling the, the liberals, a lot we're calling the conservatives, and a lot we're calling the swingers. So that if you have two judges who are liberals, two judges who are conservative, we thought three could swing whichever way because of their past history as, as, as practitioners. If I were to ask you today, can you tell of the Supreme Court of Kenya who are the liberals, who are the conservatives, who are the swingers? Can you? I don't know. That is for you to judge. I know where I stand for myself. So judges can be subjective, but they must explain themselves within the bounds of the law. A lot of you who read the decision of uh, and, and uh, 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 my brother in Pretoria knows the debate in South Africa around the ICJ, uh, uh, Israel and Gaza, and my friend Judge Sebutinde's um, dissent. What drove one judge out of all those judges to dissent on such a matter? It's because we are all products of our socialization, our training, our religion. So yes, judges should can be subjective, but judges must remain objective. You must always be able to give a reason. And that's why we have dissents. A little history here of, of, a, of, a, of a court where one judge wrote uh, a decision for the majority, a unanimous decision as agreed in conference. But later when they came back to conference on the draft, there was a disagreement. And the judge went and wrote a dissent on his draft. That is how human beings operate. But the majority got to get their decision. The minority had a dissent. But whatever happens, whatever the end game, judicial independence, both individual and institutional must never be compromised. Neither should impartiality ever be compromised. So in answer to the question by my colleague, my, my friend, there is no doubt that whereas judges can think the way they want to think, they should never compromise fairness and respect for the rule of law. I will jump to issues. I will jump to issues, which was efficient and expeditious access and delivery, which was my paper. I will jump the issue of professionalism. But I should say this because it has been raised in one of the questions you said. I will not address the Hamenasser Supreme Court question for obvious reasons. That matter is in court at the High Court, in the East African Court. It would be quite, um, it would be quite improper of me at this point to make any comments uh, on that case. Had it not been in court, I would be, I would have been quite happy 
uh, to hold my views on, on, on the subject. But that's all I can say. But back to my subject. There is a presumption that judges, no, let me go back. When I joined the judiciary in 2003, I found a court of judges who later Chief Justice Mutunga called demigods. Judges who believed that they were way beyond anybody. Nobody could talk to them. Nobody could challenge them. They could not be trained because they knew the law. I can assure you guys, for those who are here uh, before 2003, before radical surgery, the judiciary has changed in a million times. The conduct of judges and magistrates, of course, we are human beings. Some may be wanting, but in fact, we have gone way, way beyond my own expectations since I joined the bench. A judge should be respectful and courteous to lawyers, parties, and witnesses, must maintain control of the proceedings. And I beg of you, ladies and gentlemen, let us not have this continuous, acrimonious engagement that I'm seeing cropping into our profession. What is so difficult about engaging each other intellectually without shouting from both sides, both from our side and from your side? Why can't we go to the days when you go to court, you come out so happy about how you are treated by the lawyer and how you are treated by a judge? We can go back to that. What is this Matusi that is coming to the profession? All of us must be able to have courtesy and respect. We must be punctual in, 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 in our trials. Some of you may have remembered when I was in the high court and uh, I would come to the building at 5.30 or 5.45 in the morning and uh, at nine sharp I'm in court and some guy who uh, I saw the day before would be staggering in at 10 to say, my Lord, I got in traffic. I said, why don't you go to your office at five like I did? Punctuality, punctuality and keeping time. Let me close this bit of the presentation by speaking to something which I touched on, but which I think I must go back to. The duty to ensure rationale and clarity in court decisions. One of the things the Supreme Court has done and will continue to do is rationalize conflicting decisions of the Court of Appeal. A lot of you may remember the, the crisis we had regarding arbitrations, where the question of leave after Section 35 Proceedings of the Arbitration Act to the Court of Appeal or no leave. And we settled it in uh, New to Aggravate. Please read New to Aggravate and Synergy. Please read Synergy versus Cape Holdings. In those two cases, we settled a conflict which was apparent uh, in the Court of Appeal. We shall continue to do so. And lastly, on this particular point, I wrote something on Facebook, I think last week. JV Witty of the ODPP had made a commentary about a particular matter. And I just wrote to, to on his wall and said, this is the way a, a, a judgment can be critiqued with professionalism and without insults. Not like the guy who called our judgment the Supreme Court heresy. You don't have to say heresy. You say the decision is unreasoned, it's unclear, the rationale is not clear to me. That's the language of lawyers. We are not, we are not Maka dealers. Neither are we zealots who believe in heresy and things like those. We are lawyers. Our language is law and English, not Samburu. And I said in that uh, thing that uh, there is need for us to go back to good critique so that if a judgment is not well reasoned, the rationale is not, not clear. I have seen in Platform Magazine, thanks to Gutobi Manyara, fantastic critiques of our judgments, and I've learned a lot from them. Sometimes not every judgment, sometimes some judgments, you lose things, you miss points, you, you miss issues. But if they are pointed to you in a critique which is scholarly, respectful, professional, ethical, you pick on it in another judgment. 
those who have followed uh, the Supreme Court judgments in Gatarao Putamunya will see that the court has over time clarified Gatarao Putamunya. Because of critiques that have come through the uh, judgments, uh, th through filings, and also through critiques in a Ruby Law Monthly, in platform, but not the one line tweeters, tweets by twats. You cannot critique a judgment of 100 pages by two lines on Twitter. Write a reasoned scholarly article, it shall make sense. Let me then move to the third part of the conversation. And I'll make this very short because this would have been longer and I'm out of time. When you come to Supreme Court, please follow the filing procedures. And the procedures are different depending on the matter. The filing procedures for presidential election petitions are different because the rules for presidential election petitions are different. Please read those rules and see how we have tried to use the 14 days we have to ensure that filings are fair. Somebody asked me, are those 14 days sufficient for the court to make a good determination? It's not. We hardly sit during that period. We are not at home. We are in some hiding place. You're not in your usual. This is my, my, my position of uh, comfort in my house. Living in a hotel, bed may not be comfortable. The bed, I mean, there are many other factors. But truth be said, that time is sufficient. Last year, we tried for the first time to do a, a, a small recount of certain polling stations. I wish we had more time. We wrote to the uh, BOMAS uh, project, now called the NADCO report, uh, which produced the NADCO report. We asked for 30 days. I'm told they are proposed 21. So an extra seven days. What can you do, even if you wanted to look at all the ballot boxes in the country, can you do it in seven days and still do a judgment? There is a problem there. And you, law society, are not helping us make that case. You bash us for other reasons. You can't help us in other issues. Please look at those rules. Similarly, the filing of an opinion, uh, adversary opinion, I spoke to the need for uh, the Attorney General's petition uh, uh, authority. I don't need to go back there. In petitions, I would just like to raise two questions. Filing usual petitions, appeals from the Court of Appeal, whether uh, as a matter of right or as a matter of uh, general public importance. Please be careful. I have seen parties where a petition is filed under GPI. So you've got to leave from the Court of Appeal or from us. And then another party files a cross appeal. But who has told you to file a cross appeal on matters of general public importance? Who has certified your matters as being matters of general public importance? Please read and understand our decisions. I've spoken about electoral applications. I won't go back there. I've spoken about case management. I won't go back there. I will now go into the third question, which is what I was calling tips from the bench. And that's my last presentation before I allow you to uh, ask questions. Earlier, I said preparation, clarity, communication. Please take these notes of what I'm going to say. The first issue is do you whether to appeal or not? Now, I have noticed that the Supreme Court of Kenya, very many matters come as if the Supreme Court is a casino. So you say, but in a Cebu, let me chance, let me try my luck. One of the rules, ethical rules I know about that I was told by Mutula Kilonzo, deceased at the School of Law was you must make a conscious decision whether your client likes it or not as an advocate. So not every appeal must come to us. I've said why. So you must make a decision to say, having looked at judgment of the Court of Appeal and the pleadings, these are matters that can go to the Court of Appeal and succeed. I'm happier if you say it's a 50-50 matter. But if you know very well the chance of losing are 80%, you still come. You're acting unethical. However broke you are and the fees will probably sustain you for two months, drop it. The second issue is diligence and drafting. You must be 
good, I, I don't know why lawyers these days are struggling with something called grammar. Struggling with simple pleading drafting. Incoherence in pleadings at the court of appeal at the Supreme Court. Why? Why are you there then? Seven judges whose experience in law is cumulatively 600 years, and you bring matope pleadings. You must always be prepared because you can't get a sound judgment in favor of your client if your own pleadings, if your own submissions are not sound. Arnold picked on something called, which is called understanding the legal issues at hand, legal arguments. Read. Lawyers don't read anymore. They read, they read their Facebook, not law books. But if you don't read, if you don't know, like the lawyer in, uh, in, in uh, uh, um, Nicolas Salat, who didn't know the rules had been repealed. It happened to me in uh, Embu. An advocate came and presented a yellow copy an old copy of civil procedure rules, which had long been amended. When I dismissed the application, he filed a review saying that uh, he had not known that the rules had been repealed. How do you expect me to review? Please have your legal issues and arguments at hand. Communication. If you're not clear, if you're not coherent, if you're not complete, if you're not compelling, in your arguments, don't come to the Supreme Court. Laws, relevant laws, authorities. If you don't have them right, go and hire goods. The Supreme Court is not very kind to verbosity. So that if you think you can come to the Supreme Court of Kenya and argue for two hours, you'll never get that. The most I've seen in my eight years is one hour. Even in those big petitions you have seen, the most is two hours. Prepare yourself in a way that you can condense your arguments in 20 minutes. In the Supreme Court of the US, they have a buzzer. If it turns green, you start. It turns red. If you have said nothing in between, that's your problem. We have it here, but we are very kind. The chief justice and presiding judges are very kind. They allow parties to go. You want five more minutes, three more minutes, five more minutes. If Why don't you learn to time yourself before you come to court? Look in the mirror with your submissions and submit to yourself and time yourself. I've done that. In my presentation, sometimes I do that. In the, in the high court, I used to do that. Think of timeliness. Think of what you can do. Professionalism. We are losing it as a profession. We are called learned, but I doubt we are learned anymore. We don't read anyway, so how can we be learned? Treat judges and court personnel with courtesy. Act with candor, honesty, and fairness towards your colleagues and the court. There are the kind of letters I see exchanged between advocates tell me there's something wrong. Some guys have gone to pick a copy of uh, Shakespeare's complete works. They pick excerpts from them and then throw them into a letter insulting a colleague. Then they copy the court. Why? Accept all rulings, whether you love them or not, all judgments, whether you like them or not. Follow procedures in seeking their review. Or if it's the end of the road, it's the end of the road. C'est la vie. Nothing can do. Let me close by saying this. Some of you may remember, um, I think it was in 2014 or 15, I, I gave a, 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 an, an evening speech to the Nairobi Law Society at Carnival. And I titled my speech, The 24 Mistakes Advocates Make in Court. I wish I could have traced that paper and circulated. Many mistakes are made during oral arguments that actually kill your client's case. I've spoken some of them. But the most important lesson I should tell you today is prepare, prepare, prepare. Your authorities, your points of law, 
your points of fact. Keep them within time. Be clear, be concise, be deliberate. Know when to emphasize what. Know when to read what. Ultimately, when you leave the court, you ought to be sure that you've done the best for yourself, for your client, for the court, for the administration of justice, and for the rule of law. And that you have upheld the oath you took the day you were sworn as an advocate. A lot of us forget the day, we, the day once we take pictures at the CJ's uh, um, garden, we forget the oath to uphold the constitution, to do justice of your favor. At the end of the day, when you walk out of court, be sure you have done your best and that whether you lose or win, it is the best you could have given. I thank you very much. Uh, for your attention. I had a lot more to say, but I'm afraid time is not on our side. Thank you, and back to you, Ernest. Thank you, Judge, uh, for that amazing presentation. And you'll all agree with me that uh, due to time constraints, there is a, a lot, a lot, a lot to discuss, especially about the Supreme Court. Now, my, uh, uh, my take away uh, from that uh, brief discussion is that, number one, as advocates, we need to uphold the values of our profession and uphold administration of justice, and more importantly, to exercise due diligence when drafting. Now, again, another uh, very important takeaway is in terms of just familiarizing ourselves uh, with the decisions of the Supreme Court. And for this one, I'll even indicate the way we are so familiar with GLA versus Kasman Brown, the way uh, we are familiar with, with Raylands versus Fletcher, uh, Mukisa Biscuit, uh, Motor Vessel, Lillian S, and all that. Yeah, it is prudent that as we read even out of curiosity when we read uh, Supreme Court decisions. Yeah? For example, there, there are certain uh, decisions by now we all uh, should, should be at our fingertips. For example, if you want to deal, uh, for example, with issues of extension of time at the, uh, the Supreme Court, you fall back to the decision in Nicholas uh, Kiptos Alat, this is the IEBC. Again, uh, for example, if you want to deal with the question of locus, who has the locus to file an appeal at the Supreme Court? Definitely the decision that comes to mind is the decision by the Law Society of Kenya versus the Communication Authorities of Kenya. Then in terms of admission of additional evidence, remember the Cyrus Girongo versus Soy Developments Limited. Then in terms of certification and principles of certification, we have the Hamanas uh, Philippa Sein decision. And then again, the, the most important question again, whether the Supreme Court is bound by its own decision. Remember the Frederick Outa decision by the Supreme Court. And again, uh, another uh, a question that people still grapple with, especially as advocates, as we read uh, the Supreme Court uh, decisions every time they come out, is whether the Supreme Court is bound or where, whether it can depart and in what instances can the Supreme Court depart from its own decision? Remember just Beer, Rai versus Rai. Always remember that decision where the court outlined uh, the decision. Now, uh, at this juncture, permit me to invite the commissioner to take the first uh, questions. Then I'll pick it uh, after that, Commissioner. Thank you, thank, thank you, Arnold, and uh, thank you, uh, Justice Lenola, for that succinct and uh, very timely presentation. Uh, Judge, I have three or four questions for you. The first is for from myself, and it is uh, concerning arbitration. From your decision in neutral. Uh, Agrovet versus Airtel, you limited the right of appeal in terms of arbitral awards to the Court of Appeal. But there is something important that you said that is almost lost in a paragraph. I think it's, a, it's paragraph 77 of that judgment where you say that you cannot introduce constitutional matters or a constitutional attack under section 35 of the arbitration act so the question is this is it possible therefore then to attack an arbitral an arbitral award outside 35 as a constitutional attack and if you do that then should that be through you know the normal proceedings where you file a plaint plead your case and present evidence that is the first question the second question is a question that has been asked by my friend uh, Ochen Dudley about the right of appeal to the Supreme Court. 
and he asks, what about uh, outlier cases where the Court of Appeal commits a jurisdictional wrong? For instance, it, deny, it denies a party a fair hearing at the point of the Court of Appeal. Can that issue, having a reason for the first time at the Court of Appeal, be an issue now that can be determined by the Supreme Court? Mm. Then the third question is a question that has again been asked by my friend or a comment, and I would wish that you respond to it, jo uh, Joshua Nyao, about the Supreme Court departing from uh, its uh, previous decisions or judgments. The question he puts is, is this way, is that why is it so uncomfortable for the court to have the judicial humility to accept whether it committed a wrong in a previous uh, case or appreciate that it's departing from uh, a previous decision. And he gives an example of Popat versus Abina Chege and Kibos versus Abida. I think we'll start with that and then maybe we proceed to the next uh, uh, questions. Okay. Um... Newtu and the Synergy and Geochem are three decisions you must read if you are to understand the reasoning of the Supreme Court in matters arising from Section 35 of the Arbitration Act. And I think we should not uh, cherry pick issues. What is the purpose of Section 35? Section 35 is either, it actually is setting aside the arbitral awards, and the grounds for setting aside are set out in Section 35. There are no constitutional questions in Section 35. The other way you can come from arbitral award is come for enforcement, I think, under Section 10 or 12. There are no constitutional questions. So what goes to the Court of Appeal? I used some words uh, uh, in passing earlier where I said ingenuity from the bar. Why can't advocates appreciate new to aggravate and paragraph 77? I wish I could tell you how it came to be written. It was a very, very important uh, uh, paragraph in that judgment of Newton. If you must then, and I will guide you how to do, if you are to abide by Newton, if you are to abide by uh, Synergy, if you have to abide by Geochem and paragraph 77, and appreciating what section 35 says, and the grounds for setting aside an arbitral award, find a way within the constitution and the Mutunga rules to bring an arbitration question under the purview of the constitution, then let it come up for determination by the Supreme Court. And I can already see myself how that will go. But you cannot keep whining and complaining that section 77, uh, paragraph 77 is inhibitive, but you're doing nothing. And there are many other ways in which you can do so. So for me, new to synergy, geochem remain good law until we overturn it. And now let me go to uh, my friend uh, Dudley's uh, um, question. And by the way, I've not told him congratulations for his Jurist of the Year Award last year. The, earlier in my presentation, I, I gave an indicator how the Supreme Court can sometimes decide as the apex court to address an injustice committed by the Court of Appeal. And one of the cases where we did this is the Asanyo case. What happened in Asanyo? In Asanyo, three judges sit. When the three judges sit, they say, we are going to go this way. But one judge pulls out to write a judgment in a civil matter, not criminal. You know that criminal two can sign and one uh, it doesn't have to. And then they gave a third judge and a fourth judge to read the judgment, Mwera. And Mwera says, I have an email from one judge saying that he's not party to this judgment. And then I have a judgment signed by two judges which I'm going to read. Of course, there was a problem. So when, when, when Osano came to, to our court, we said, 
we can, in such a circumstance, address the issue of injustice committed by the Court of Appeal. And we did. We sent it back and asked a, a new bank to hear the matter. So, Chell, again, it is how you frame your matter. It's how you address your matter. It's how you plead your matter. If you come with the expectation, there is a mess, please undo it. You must frame it. You must craft it in a way that the court, Supreme Court is duty bound by the Constitution to address injustice. And it has been done. So, so no, it's not, it's not a closed door, contrary to what people are saying. Joshua, I don't know why this kind of language, the Supreme Court lacks humility, uh, you should accept. Arnold, thank you Arnold for that addition. The Supreme Court has said, in Rai versus Rai, if you want the Supreme Court to depart from previous decision, or if you want the Supreme Court to overturn itself, there is a procedure for doing so. But it's not enough to, to speak to it here and say Kibos and Abida are different, Garisa Chengo and, and, and Kibos are in conflict. Bring it. And but there is not a unique situation. When I was at the High Court, um, we realized that the Court of Appeal, which was the Apex Court then, because sometimes different benches of Court of Appeal judges sit in different towns, they issue decisions that conflict. So I raised in the judge's colloquium. I said to Judge Umolo, who was then the presiding judge, what happens if I find that one case conflicts with another and I don't know which one to use? He told me, use the one that favors your case. So if you think that if you come to the Supreme Court or you go to the High Court, a bidder suits your case, it is a decision of the Supreme Court, use it. If you think uh, Kibos favors your case, use it. And then a day will come when another party will bring the two decisions in a logical, clear, concise manner and tell the, court of, the Supreme Court, you said this here, you said this. For example, I am waiting for someone to tell me what the conflict is between Kibos and Abida. Nobody has written a, a, a legal critique, and I, I challenge any of you to do it, to say there's a problem. It is not enough to pick uh, 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 things from the air and say there's a conflict. Show me. And that's why I said, write, write, write scholarly papers. You know? But nobody has done that. So it is possible. It is possible. We can do it. But bring it to the court in a proper manner. Thank you. Uh, number four. Thank you. I just had only one question, then I can hand over to Arnold Judge. If you read... Uh... When you, you when you began, you spoke about the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Yes. And uh, uh, one, <laughs> three, three, three A and B. Yes. And and I've always it's always occurred to me in B B two says that part of your jurisdiction is from any other court. I know the tribunal that probably is uh, prescribed. Maybe the the tribunal by the it says uh, under tribunal by national legislation. Yes. Now the question is: Is there an instance whereby uh, there is there has been an appeal, or there is uh, a chance that somebody can appeal from any other court besides the court of appeal? And which court would that be, or uh, which tribunal, except obviously the one that is provided in the constitution for judges? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, this is the difficulty with the those additions in crafting of uh, uh, the constitution or statute where you say subject to national legislation. So that if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, that provision, um, 163. Yes, 163B. Yeah, yeah, I know it, I know it. Yes. So, um, appears from any other court or tribunal as prescribed by national legislation. Where is that legislation? It doesn't exist. So one of the things that you could do as a commissioner and uh, uh, your colleagues in the law society is to say to parliament, create this structure where, for example, um, a certain, I don't know which one, I can't think about it and I can't remember 
when we were drafting this constitution, I can't remember why we came up, whether it was we at CKRC who brought this or it was um, the committee of experts. But without legislation, then we are stuck with that position which uh, the Mutunga rules suffered for a long time. That we have no rules to operationalize the Bill of Rights, so you can't apply the Bill of Rights. If we have a legislation, it can work. But uh, we received one such uh, one such appeal from the Cooperative Tribunal. But we struck it out because the Cooperative Tribunal has a procedure for appeals reviews to the to the High Court. So we said, as long as there is a law that gives you power, uh, jurisdiction to go to other courts, you can't what. Uh, Arnold was calling leapfrogging, you can't leapfrog under this provision. So truth be said, it's a redundant provision for as long as uh, there's no legislation. And for as long as all the tribunals that exist in this country today have a legal framework, including on appeals. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Thank you. Uh, Arnold, now you can start your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, and I think that the last question is an important question because uh, and I think that was one of the reasons why the section 11, section 11, I think, of the 2011 rules was repealed because it had provided a, a blanket a provision whereby somebody could appeal a decision directly. You could yes. leapfrog, actually. But now it was uh, subsequently and I, I, I struck it out while I was in yes. high court. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then, uh, I just I think you've answered most of the questions because they border mostly on... Uh, first jurisdiction of the court. And secondly, uh, I've seen some of the questions that are so specific and the, the answers lie uh, in most of the decisions that the Supreme Court has rendered. Okay. Yeah, so uh, one of the questions somebody posed is that uh, the Supreme Court's certification of matters of general public importance is more and more appearing to be flippant and lacking in predictability. Uh, How will the court strive to bring a semblance of predictability for the benefit of practitioners then uh, secondly, related to that issue of certification, uh, somebody uh, uh, asked, can a party apply for certification of a matter in the Court of Appeal on a matter of public interest and simultaneously proceed to the Supreme Court on a direct route as provided for in law? What is the effect, if any, of a party, of a party opening, or opting for this? Yeah? Placing a multi, <laughs> a multi bet, just yeah. gambling. I think Judge, you can take those ones for now. Okay. So, 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 um, I think, uh, like I said, it would be helpful if I got, um, for example, somebody saying, in this ruling, you said this. In this ruling, you said this. Because each matter that comes to the court is invariably different. And in exercise of discretion, the court looks at different circumstances depending on the matter. So that not, not whereas we use the Amanda Philippa Stein uh, guidelines, there are some matters that the court will think and say, look, um, although this is a 50-50 case, give the parties a chance. Remember the, 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 the principle underlying GPI. It is a matter that affects the public greatly, which is a better risk to throw out the matter or to grant the parties an opportunity to ventilate it, even if you're going to dismiss it later. So, so you see the, the conceptual philosophical basis behind GPI would sometimes necessitate that the court may actually exercise discretion and grant audience only to be sure that they have not locked out a genuine case. But I would I'd be happy if someone could send to me even directly or through Omwanza or through Arnold Give me two or three cases where the GPI jurisdiction has been inconsistent. I am I'm very keen myself. Those of you who know, I read a lot. And I read our decisions extremely seriously. I would have picked out an inconsistency somehow. But I'm human. I could have missed something. If there is any, let me know. It would be very helpful to the court, very helpful to the public. Now, the, the, the debate whether you can... You can, but in a Cebu, um, a, a certification, we have said no. Um, we have said, uh, first got the Court of Appeal. The, the, there must be order in these things. You can't chance. Suppose now the Court of Appeal refuses to certify. The, the Supreme Court certifies, or the Court of Appeal certifies. Court, Supreme Court, no, you can't do that. It's just, it's just, just untidy. So we have said, it is better for you to have two chances. 
than to have one. If you come straight to the Supreme Court, that's the end of you. And that's why we said, have an opportunity to interrogate at the Court of Appeal. If you lose, then you come to us for a second bite of the cherry. That's a better way of looking at it. If you win, then you, you, you are in anyway. So I don't think anybody should complain that we have said go back to the Court of Appeal because it just gives you two opportunities uh, to, to get to the end of the same thing. But, but uh, to do both, we have said no. And in fact, we've struck out matters where parties are, are doing a, a casino job with the with certification. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Arnold, Arnold, let me just ask one question, then you continue. Judge, I thought this is interesting. Yes, please. And Rod, you can respond to it by my colleague, uh, Mr. Mogere. Mm -hmm. He asks, he, say, he says, or poses that uh, in most of the Supreme, top Supreme Courts around the world, uh, the, the hearings are very interactive. Yes. And sometimes very clear and intense, uh, robust engagement between the bar and the bench. But he notes that our court, especially our Supreme Court, seem not to have too much or any intervention from the, the bench when uh, advocates are doing their presentations. Good, very good to you. Very good question. So, and I thought that's why, that's why, that's why I thought I should bring it to your attention. That yes. so, as members of the bar, uh, we would wel welcome a thorough and interactive interrogation of issues during actual hearing, because then it clarifies issues about uh, that come to the Supreme Court. Because these are very serious issues, and this also happens in most of the other uh, courts. Uh, possibly you can uh, respond to this. Yes, yes. That, that's thank you, Guto. That's a very good question. But you know, you must appreciate um, that. Each country has its own unique circumstances. You saw that the Ugandan uh, Supreme Court yesterday delivered that decision on, uh, on the Homosexuality Act. And they, they, they know their situation, so they played safe, no doubt about that. We did what we did here. In the election petition, and now I can discuss it because it's way behind us, I took flack for my questions to parties. But people don't know that, I mean, some of you may know that I'm in charge of ICT in the judiciary. So I, I, I understand this thing probably more than my colleagues. So it was my duty by the court to engage on matters ICT. But what happened afterwards? I took flack. I was bashed from to that day until today as if I was only judge in that court. So sometimes uh, 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 the, the, the courts and judges for their own reasons, take decisions in a particular way. What we said as a practice, as this court, we realize that what happens uh, whenever we engage in the middle of submissions is that counsel loses track, judges lose track, the record, the, the written record, the, the transcriptions later become jumbled up. So we thought it is more elegant for an advocate to submit as they wish within their time. And then we engage after that for as long as we want. And Guto, you know this very well because you've appeared there. There are some matters where we have engaged way beyond uh, the given time, depending on the nature of the matter and depending on the nature of your submission. But you can also not engage counsel who don't seem to have anything to say. Because sometimes you find counsel has come with a script. When you try to engage them, they don't know how to get out of the script. And that's what I was saying, preparation. If you have known your case, you anticipate questions, then you can be able to answer. But if you come with a script, and when you ask your questions outside the script, you know, sometimes we go out after court and we say, what happened just, what happened just now? This guy didn't know anything outside the, the, the script. So I know I've sat in, uh, as, as, as an observer in many of these courts, like I said, but I think our style is still the better. I remember during the BBI case, uh, and one judge on Facebook said they are sitting there like seven sphinxes, sphinxes those, those uh, uh, Egyptian uh, uh, um, I call it pyramids, not saying anything. But later when we engaged, parties understood that we are not just quiet, we are giving you a chance to select your case, then you interrogate your case. So I think myself from experience, our style is better than uh, what happens in the U.S. In the U.S., for example, it's it's actually the most unfair if you have to follow that style. Like I said, you are given 20 minutes. And as soon as you start, the judges, they start engaging you. 
the five questions are true. By the time the 20 minutes are, are finished, you have said nothing of what you wanted to say. So we are telling ourselves we should not make we should not make oral submissions and highlighting of submissions an academic exercise. And that it's us who are trying to convince each other, because that's what US judges do. They ask you questions to convince each other of their positions. And they take positions openly in court. We can't do that in this country. The day I start taking a position during submissions is the day you take me to Omoza and say he had already made up his mind. Then you take transcripts and say, look at the question. He even said, my view is before the judgment. So, so um, Oguto, you may be attracted to what they do in the U U US. I am not. And I doubt any of my colleagues is. Thank you. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, then another burning question, which I'm also seeing in the chat is, uh, that uh, based on the uh, existing jurisprudence from the Supreme Court, there seems to be uncertainty in terms of that the court is not clear when it's departing or taking a different position from its previous position. And a good example somebody has raised is the question of, uh, for example, judicial immunity. So that uh, if we remember the decision in Belevu, uh, Belevu Development Limited versus Justice Gikonyo, the court said judicial immunity was absolute. But then again, uh, early this year, earlier on, in the Chitembo decision, the court said uh, it is not absolute. So that uh, the uncertainty comes when now it is upon, I don't know, uh, for us practitioners, what to do? Do we imply, do we assume that the court has departed from that decision? That is one question. Then uh, the second question that we also got, uh, well, although I mentioned most of these questions, the answers are in the authorities. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> somebody asked, although it is not uh, contextualized, Somebody just asked, what happens if the Supreme Court gets it wrong? Yeah, it's so open-ended. I wish it had more context. Yeah, then the other question is, are there exceptions to the AG's office to approach the Supreme Court without certification by the Court of Appeal? Again, as I mentioned, the answer to that yeah, yeah. probably- Some, some of the questions are not clear, but, but let me begin yes. from the last one. Yes. The, the, AG, the AG is, a litigant like any other. So the fact that the AG um, comes and uh, seeks interpretation on a matter of public, general public interest, he, he comes like everybody else. He must seek certification. So there is no, the AG does not get any privileges that uh, you or or Guto or whoever else acting for another party does not get. So that's that's straightforward. What happens if the Supreme Court gets it wrong? You know, it's not a new question. And uh, for the 200 years plus, the American Supreme Court has been alive. The question of infallibility of the court, are they, are they, are they, are they final because they're infallible? Are they infallible because they're final? That debate continues. Of course, the Supreme Court can get it wrong, but get it wrong as, opposed, as against what? What is the measure? You know, between two judges of the high court, uh, or between two courts in Machakos and the Nairobi of the High Court, you can go to one and say, this one is right, this one is wrong. But there's only one Supreme Court. We don't even have benches of the Supreme Court. There's only one court. So how does it get it wrong? What, what is the measure? What, uh, what is a wrongometer? If there's something like that, like passionometer. You can't. The best you can do is argue that the court is inconsistent. And, and that, that, that's a debatable question. But being wrong, it's final. It's like saying the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, can be wrong. Yes, he can, but he's final. Or the day you go to heaven and you're told when you move to your hell, you say, my Lord, the Lord, no, 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 you are wrong. No, it's over. So for the Supreme Court, the window we gave you is a window of review in Uta. Please read Frederick Uta. We have said, and we realize this is precisely why we gave the decision nota. We said, suppose we have made an error of law, of whatever kind. So follow Uta. Come and say, you know, this is, but people are coming out to coming to us under Uta as another appeal from our own appeal. For read Uta, then, like I said, ingenuity, genius, use the Uta to show us we are wrong. Use Rai versus Rai to show us we are wrong. But for you to come and say uh, you are wrong only because you are dissatisfied, we'll dismiss you again. Um, Bellevue and Chitembwe, I, I don't know 
I haven't understood where the the conflict between Chitembwe and Bellevue is. Because in Chitembwe, Bellevue was quoted at length. And I thought myself that uh, in Chitembwe, we actually entrenched the principle in, in, in Bellevue, but we are also saying the circumstances in Chitembwe were different. Because the reasons for removal, my friend, my brother and classmate and friend Chitembwe had nothing to do with immunity. It had to do with conduct, which he himself had admitted on KTN. So, 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 uh, and on and, and and on the proceedings before the JSC. So, for me, it is very difficult to say that uh, Bellevue and Chitembwe are, are, are inconsistent. In fact, they build on each other. And I said earlier, for example, that in uh, in Peter Munya, we kept clarifying Peter Munya uh, uh, until we settled it in 20, uh, 20, 2018 and twenty twenty. So when advocates bring issues that need tying up, because sometimes a paragraph may be misunderstood by counsel, just like happened in uh, in in, uh, in Muruatetu. So you, we need to clarify it, not overturning ourselves. We clarify. For example, Omoza has raised uh, paragraph seventy-seven of uh, of uh, of a uh, neutral. There may come a time when we need to expand seventy-seven and clarify it further. But we are not overturning ourselves. And the court, like I said earlier, 163.7, the court is not bound by its decision. So if a court can say, the court can say in a different decision, we say this in, in, uh, in YouTube, we are now adding as follows. There is not inconsistency there. It's a clarification. It's an addition. And so for me, um, unless somebody points to me with detail, the difference between Bellevue and Chitembwe, I am convinced that uh, uh, Chitembwe developed and clarified Bellevue, and then distinguished Bellevue in terms of immunity because of Chitembo's specific and unique circumstances in his case. Thank you again for that. Very useful questions. I'm quite happy, actually. Yeah, no, actually I'm, I'm back that, to so, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, Arnold, let me follow up on uh, that question. Uh, yes. That the that, uh, uh, judge speaks about in Ota. Uh, judge, there is... Um, a principle of finality in terms of you know going all the way to the supreme court yes but that is a principle that has been over time developed through common law yes and then sometimes you get a competing interest that will be a competing interest directly against finality for instance if there is fraud that is raised against a, uh, a judgment and I've seen that mm -hmm. in judgment of uh, Mzrai versus uh, Patel of the Supreme Court of the UK, where there were two competing, mm -hmm. competing interests, one on finality and one on fraud. And the court said that though common law had settled the issue of finality, there are instances mm -hmm. whereby the court can reopen a judgment, particularly because of fraud or or something that is so egregious that you know the court can show, not shut its eyes to. Is therefore is there a possibility therefore because you know the Supreme Court as you said is is the court you know it's just like you go to the Lord and you're told go to hell mm. or God or you remain in heaven mm. so would would that principle be something that can again be engaged you know this is just theoretical it's not a, a, a case that is that's live that can now be engaged in our Supreme Court whereby you say okay we know that we are the final court but there are instances whereby we can revisit our judgment and open it. I, I'm, I'm one believer in uh, in uh, never saying never. Okay. Because these matters have come to us before in Rai versus Rai, in Hotel Properties Limited, and we have said what we said. But who tells you that uh, if another matter comes with different nuances, with a different approach, with different arguments, the court cannot do it. This is a very young court. It's 12 years old. We have seen nothing. So that for me, there is always a possibility that uh, there, is a, there is a chance that if a matter comes in a manner that would de demand of the court, that the court seizes the moment. And constitutional moments don't come every so often. Neither do situational moments. So I, 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 can't be, I, I will never say that it can never come because it can come and the court can actually 
uh, seize it and make a decision. And there are many examples uh, in the US. So you're right. Have hope, have faith. Thank you, Dad, for that. Again, uh, uh, permit me to digress a little and go to career questions because uh, most of the uh, the participants are actually young advocates and they're yes. uh, they curious. I'll pick uh, two questions specifically. One asks, what measures has the Supreme Court taken to ensure that the court is friendly and accommodating to young advocates who are still learning many aspects of practice? Then number two, what mentorship programs does the Supreme Court have for young advocates? Um, thank you very much. That that's so. I think we we my experience. Um, let me speak for myself. When I was at the High Court, a lot of the young lawyers, some of you may be here, would remember that when you come to me under certificate of urgency. And I would have read the file and I'll see you have difficulties. And because you're experting, you have the opportunity to see that this matter should not proceed beyond here. I'll engage you, point you to the law. And often counsel has withdrawn, counsel has taught time to seek instructions, counsel has taught time to go and file a fresh one. And that for me, that is a that is the way you mold and guide young counsel. Two. At the Supreme Court, because we don't hear certificates in person, and that may be a witness you can, you can argue with me about, we, 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 we look at the file in chambers as duty judge, then you decide whether to grant orders or not to grant. I'm duty judge, for example, this week. And files can come, and I look at them, I make a decision, then the other judges can agree with me and we issue an order as a court. I think we need um, to have a more engaging uh, 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 program with young council. And I'm coming to the second question now. Um, mentorship is, there is no program for mentorship of young council in the Supreme Court, save for example, for my regular um, seminars and webinars and, 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 and speeches. And I've done this for the LSK, not once, not twice. Um, I have, however, a group which I mentor quite privately, some from School of Law, some who are in practice now. I think the oldest in the group is 35. We meet every so often, I invite a speaker. Um, the last speaker to speak to my group was um, Professor Migaya Ketch. Um, very engaging, and in fact, yesterday when he when he invited us to his inaugural lecture, I told my group to go with me um, on when he does his lecture on 26th of April. So there is no program within the court. I have mine privately, which I do as a matter of my own uh, CSR. But I agree that there is need for a more programmed uh, engagement. There, it seems to me that uh, the only time I'm invited to speak to young council is when the commissioners are looking for uh, votes. The last time I spoke to young council was when uh, Professor Gender was, was in JSC. The second time is now, uh, before Mwanza became commissioner. In fact, the reason I didn't want to speak was I didn't want to be seen like I was campaigning for him because he's my friend. But now we are doing it. I think Mwanza, you are under a challenge. Now that you're in the commission, don't drop this. Uh, keep inviting other judges uh, to speak to your to your to your to your to your to your juniors, and I think if you can, as yourself, create a program through your five years, where you can yourself be inviting us regularly. Invite me, invite Wanjala, Joki can speak about Sexual Offences Act, um, and, and the issues around the Sexual Offences Act today, um, and and what she thinks about those matters. So you can begin as part of your mandate. And then rope us in. And I think to, a, a partnership of that kind would be more useful than having ad hoc only because you want a vote to go to JSC. Have I kenned you, Omanza? No, I haven't. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. I'm going to continue this. Uh, actually, I, I am continuing with this. And this was part of the Fantastic. challenge that was presented okay. by Anka. Yeah, picking, picking it from where you've left, Oh, by the way, Arnold is one of my mentees. So why are you complaining? <laughs> That's I'm not complaining. Hey, yes. Uh, so, uh, from where we've left that, yeah? uh, Yes. 
is asking whether they can how they can join your mentorship group, whether you have a link and all those modalities. Probably we can share with them. Um, now coming back to the chat to the what, what I'll do what, what, what yes. I will do on that yes. one because before I forget the the the, the convener is um uh Benedict Nzioka uh, yes. who has a farm I think he has a farm with Kipto Torore they are the two conveners so I can send their numbers to Arnold please get yes. get get their contact from Arnold then those who want to join can join there, there's no there, there's no there's no issue yeah, yes. Just uh, due to time, uh, permit me to rush uh, through the Q and questions in the chat. Now, yes. somebody asks, uh, uh, this is a bus, a smile, asks, uh, Judge, if a party comes to the Supreme Court under 163.4a, believing that it has a direct access right, but the petition is struck out, can the party invoke the certification process under 163.4b to urge that the intended appeal raises matters of public importance? Then another question uh, from Weekly for you. Uh, this is in line with Article 1637, where the Supreme Court is bound by uh, uh, all other courts are bound by the decisions by the Supreme Court. So that Weekly asks, uh, what happens? How are we to deal with authorities from lower courts, noting that they are not binding to the Supreme Court? Yeah. And then, what is their persuasive value, if any? If, for example, I argue my case at the Supreme Court, yeah. and I'm relying basically on decisions. Uh, from the law courts. Then, yeah. uh, courts. okay, again, that is, a, again, somebody also asked a similar question on the mm -hmm. effect, finding effect of the law court decisions. Yeah, Judge, you can pick those ones as I look through. Okay, um, <laughs> I, I've seen, I've seen uh, um, applications like this where somebody files as a matter of right, uh, then loses. You can't you can't go back because then if you go back to the court of appeal to seek certification, the other party will argue it's res judicata because you've already exhausted your appeal mechanism. So it, it doesn't work, uh, and we would not ourselves. I would I'll be I'd be lying if I said that uh, we could tolerate such a such a, an abuse of court process because that's what I said at the beginning. The decision to appeal must be yours as counsel. So by the time you choose. 4A instead of 4B, it is your choice. You live with it. So, so it's an abuse of court process to chance both. So don't even try. Or your, the Supreme Court, in a sense of, the Supreme Court of Kenya, in a sense, is unique. Because since Justice Mutunga's court, the court has not been shy to borrow persuasive authorities, even from the High Court. Only to the extent that those decisions have not been appealed. So if a party comes um, and throws a decision and we find that the matter is pending before appeal, we would not use it. And it's a risky venture for any uh, apex court to use lower court authorities as persuasive authorities without the mechanism to know if an appeal may overturn that authority. So as a matter of, as a principle, we do not generally uh, pick decisions from the high court as persuasive authority or the ELC. But I've seen some have been picked only because they are persuasive or are held by the Court of Appeal. Uh, so to that extent, yes. But ordinarily, uh, we, we try to keep to our decisions. Uh, but remember, as a young court, you are stuck with, with the fact that not you don't have too much material of your own. The American Supreme Court has been around for 200 years, so they have covered literally everything under the sun. They have their own decisions. And then again, you, because of our constitution and its infrastructure, its structure and architecture, we may not get material from other countries that fit into our circumstances. So we may need to borrow from other courts. And by the way, there's something beautiful and encouraging for the Supreme Court to persuasively use an authority from a high court judge. It's encouraging for that judge to know they did something serious. And, and I find that myself, when they were quoting me in the, when I was at the high court, I felt good because it means I'm doing something right. But of course the risk of quoting uh, a decision that may be overturned is real, but we do it. We, we, are not, we are not handicapped like other courts by, by persuasive authorities from wherever. And that's why if you look at Mitu Bell uh, and um, Moi Educational Center, we quoted from the UN, guy, the UN uh, uh, documents, we quoted from wherever, so we, we are not stuck. Eric Guitari on the, on the 
on the right of association of the LGBT community we quoted from everywhere. So again, we are not stuck. Yeah. Yeah, then the, uh, uh, let me take the last final one. two. Yes, last one. Uh, okay, for Achenga Dero, this one is found in authorities. We'll share the decision on the question whether uh, whether advisory opinions are binding. The answer is in the affirmative, they're binding. We'll share authority on that. Now, uh, Moses Masai puts the re matter yeah. of IEBC so that he, he, he points out that this matter did not meet the threshold of an advisory opinion but the court went ahead to set the parameters for an advisory opinion. Equally, in Fred Uta, the court established that the matter never met the threshold for review, but the court went ahead to set the parameters for review. However, in BBI, the court avoided to pronounce itself on whether we should have a multiple referendum question or omnibus or an omnibus a question. The Court of Appeal and the High Court had pronounced themselves on that matter. Kindly clarify this. I didn't get the first one, but I got the second one. Um, the first, yes. yes. Get, so I didn't get the first one. The, the, review. the, first, one, the first one is uh, whether the Supreme Court advisory opinions are binding. So that you've answered. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Then the second, the Masai is Masai's two questions. Yeah, for Masai, his main contention is, uh, let me reread it. Uh, in the in remata of the IBC, the matter did not meet the threshold of an advisory oh, opinion. No, then it's fine. If it's if the IBC, I got I got IBC. I, I got IBC. Yes. I mean BBI. BBI. Sorry. Yeah, in BBI. I got BBI. Uh, Masai, Masai contends that uh, in BBI, remember when uh, the High Court and the Court of Appeal pronounced themselves on the referendum question, whether it should be multiple or an omnibus question. Yeah. Yes, but yes, when it yes, came yes. to the yes. Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said that question was not ripe for determination. So Masai seeks a clarification on why the Supreme Court took that approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yes. The, 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 the issue really is simple. Um, none, uh, the, 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 the matter of mute, the matter is not uh, ripe for determination. The IBC is a body mandated to determine all, all those questions. So we applied the doctrine of, of, of ripeness to say, we cannot pluck a matter away from the mandate of the IBC where that mandate has not been exercised, then proceed to give directions on it. So the only judge we agreed with was Justice Toyot, who said, it's not right. And that's all we agreed upon. So for me, there, there's no, we don't have to agree with the Court of Appeal. We don't have to agree with a single judge, but we could agree with a single judge like we did with Toyot. So for us, it was only the application of ripeness. And we said, if we pick it up, and the IBC has not even attempted to address the question, we shall be jumping the gun. That was the reasoning. And, and I think it's still correct reasoning. Yeah, thank you, Judge, for that. Although the last question, I know uh, it's a matter that is still alive. I don't know if Judge will be in a position to comment on it. Although it's burning in the chat. Yeah. The, 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 Which one? The, my colleagues are asking, what's the court justice? Which one? And court justice decision like? Go, go to your microphone. And Arnold, you're losing it. You're losing it. You're not a microphone. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Microphone, so the microphone. question is in regard to the place of the East African Court of Justice within the hierarchy of our uh, legal system. So that what is the attitude of the Supreme Court? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Although I'm alive, we are, we are aware the matter is also pending at the Supreme Court. So I don't know that's how we'll. Yeah, yeah. We can't answer that. that because we can't answer it because uh, maybe they don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. The Attorney General filed a reference taking an advisory opinion, um, asking the following questions. Number one, um, is the East African Court of Justice mandated to do a merit review of decisions of apex courts in the region? And number two, what is the effect of the ESCJ doing a merit review? Very gist question, but I'm sorry. We had the matter, we are pending, we are preparing judgment. Uh, for obvious reasons, I cannot answer it. Judge, if I might just, because it's the last question. Yes. And and uh, it's it's an interesting question because if you look at, uh, you know, the position of the Supreme Court, it would be the mm -hmm. same answer to the same position of the Supreme, uh, the Supreme Court of the UK. Mm. Now, if you followed carefully the, the trajectory that uh, the Supreme Court took, 
uh, in the UK is that when matters were not, you know, it was the final court. But what parties did is that they invoked community law. And from that, then there's been development subsequently, but either the Europe European Court of uh, Human Rights on issues, especially on negligence, um, the law on material, I think uh, adverse possession and things like that. So if this is now the theoretical, because it, it does not go to any of the cases that is before you, can our Supreme Court be influenced subsequently by you know such judgments from the say the the our East African court the same way that the house of lords has been and now subsequently the supreme court of the uk from the european court you know you know you, know, you must appreciate the the, the difference <laughs> yes. between the, the the european court of human rights yes the european court of justice yes and the east african court of justice and you must remember, I served in that court for seven years, so I know it more than any of you here. Yes. Um, we have that court, um, at least when I was there, would also pick decisions from, from, from our courts and use it in its place. We used um, uh, its decision in, I used its decision in, uh, in the Animal Welfare Society, the Serengeti Road case. I used it in the in the SGR case, of which Okoiti had filed about the question of environment. So yes, we can borrow from each other, but the question of jurisdiction is, is a different cookie altogether. Uh, and, and, and so let us wait. Let us wait for the advisory opinion. Let us wait for the matter that uh, Ochil and others filed in the East African court, the, the Sonko matter, the Karua matter, the Mabirizi matter, which are pending before that court. Then wait for advisory opinion here. There may well be meeting of minds um, as to how the the, the, the the apex courts and the ESCJ uh, uh, relate. But remember, uh, those who may not know this history, when we had the East African Court of Appeal, uh, which was the apex court in the entire region, and all the cases from the uh, various courts would go to the to ICA, it was different. And it was never meant that the East African Court of Justice would take the place of ICA. So what we are grappling with now, both ourselves and ESCJ, is how we relate in terms of execution of the mandate of ESCJ under the treaty and execution of the mandate of the apex courts under their constitutions. That's what the conundrum is. But I can't speak about it now until we resolve it one way, both courts, both the ESCJ and, 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 the, uh, and the Supreme Court. So let's wait for the judgments of the two courts. I think we can have a fantastic debate once the two courts have, uh, have ruled. Good. Yeah, thank you so much, Judge. Uh, this brings us to the end uh, of today's session. Yeah, perhaps uh, as all of you uh, will agree with me, the time was so short so that we didn't get to cover a lot. For example, if you look at uh, the whole appellate process, we just jumped straight into the Supreme Court uh, appellate process. I, ju yeah. I, jumped, I jumped all that in my paper. I yes. jumped it. Yeah, precisely, and because of the time factor, so that there is a lot, a lot, a lot to do and a lot to discuss also in terms of just the, the nitty gritties of the appellate process, yeah? So that some of these things we've done, uh, we're doing with Judge Compedium on all, on the entire appellate uh, advocacy process in Kenya, so that uh, we look at it, even the post-judgment, uh, uh, post-judgment reliefs, pre-judgment reliefs, where, whether you can file a 5 to b whether you can seek conservatory orders uh, at the appellate stage, and all that, then computation and extension of time, addition, admission of additional evidence, certification, jurisdiction to grant interim reliefs and related orders, then the components of a notice of appeal. How do we strike out a notice mm -hmm. of appeal, a valid notice of appeal? How do we institute an appeal, notice of cross appeal, nature, scope, and contents of a cross appeal? All these issues. Then again, abatement of appeals, withdrawals, yes. reliefs, and all this. So this is more detailed, and these are some of the things we're working on. On the compendium. So with uh, those few remarks, I just want to appreciate all of you for taking your time. I know it's hard getting people uh, on this afternoon with the fatigue and exhaustion and all that. Yeah, so I give it back to our commissioner to give the closing remark. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. And thank you, uh, Crispin and Jared, for the technical assistance. Thank you, uh, Justice Isaac Lenaola, for that uh, illuminating uh, presentation. In fact, I have seen a question on the 
on 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 the by one of the participants on whether you you can come again yes yes of course i'll be quite willing to come there's yes, a lot yes. i couldn't say yes 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 i i mean this is a very very wide area and uh, will as a as a commissioner i commit that i'll continue with these discussions and this uh, webinars uh, for purposes of contribution, uh, contributing to practice. Asante sana and have a lovely evening. Thank you very uh, much. Be blessed. Bye bye. And uh, see you next time. See you next time. Bye bye. And thank you so much. I appreciate. Thank you. And watch out for the next uh, uh, our next discussion. Uh, we'll be we'll be doing it monthly.